Good morning, everyone. I'm here to talk about a contrarian's guide to lean. And if any of you have ever felt a little bit stifled by the lean rules, this presentation is for you. So if you find lean rules constraining, we'll spend some time, a little bit of time, uh, coloring outside the lines. And, uh, you know, if, uh, um, over my years of experience, we've 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 worked with Lean for probably 14 years, and uh, we found some ways to do some things that are optimal, that uh, actually violate some Lean rules. And uh, we questioned in some areas, and I think some businesses uh, may may require something a little more or a little less. So. As we go through today's presentation, I'll share just a few examples and potential ideas for you as you go through your Kaizen events that you may want to take some opportunities to color outside the lines. So I found that there's only one rule that matters, and that's one of the first rules we learn in lean training is there are no sacred cows, and you can pretty much go after everything. And that also applies to lean rules. Well, I, in, I joined uh, one of our business groups in 2006, and um, we kept getting stops on our production line because of uh, some yield, yield issue or some small yield hit. And um, our product is, an, is a radio frequency product, an RF product, and oftentimes there are uh, minor anomalies in Two different components from different suppliers that may cause a little bit of a little bit of a defect and we have to go work on that but our manufacturing team was set up that every time you'd see one of these defects you can't build anymore until you figure out what's what's going on and uh we found that to be very very disruptive and so so we kept working at it and working at it and we kept educated and educated on our product and um but let me go through some of the examples I've got here. It's a great principle to not pass quality defects to the next station or team. So certainly you need to have a quality standard that doesn't allow big things to get through. Um, but what I've also discovered is over the generations of our products, we get very good at testing for and finding defects in an ever more microscopic way. And I finally had to start asking, is this a defect that the customer can detect? And uh, oftentimes we would discover that test limit relaxation was the way to go instead of fixing a product issue or a manufacturing issue. And uh, our, over the years, I, I, I managed this group for 14 years. Over the years, we had some of the best DPM defects per million at, the, at our customers of the company. Even though we, so we were over rejecting is the thing and kept stopping the manufacturing line because we kept pulling the end on cord. So, um, and as I say in my next bullet, we get stops for mostly non defects. And I can talk about a couple of examples, but uh, the example on the right is an example of silicon test. And if you know how electronics industry works, we have. Uh, silicon that comes from a wafer fab and it gets tested uh, after it's simulated and packaged. And then it goes to our board factory where we build a, a printed circuit board assembly. And this is from our silicon test. You see this little chart on the right. It's uh, got a couple of handwritten uh, A, B. Well, our test engineers at our silicon uh, test site this is not the final test. They decided that just because there was a difference in this particular mean between two different lots, they decided that uh, they should reject lot A or put it on hold, hold the end on cord. This was in the middle of NPI, where new, NPI in the electronics industry is new product introduction, where we were required to ship kit samples to customers. And they put it on hold. and we couldn't get it off hold because of the way the silicon process works for two weeks. And there was literally no defect here. And it's an interim test before we get to our final test. And this is a particular parameter that can be calibrated out in the final board assembly. So we put on hold for two weeks 
lots that seemingly were good and the only data they showed was this distribution and supplier a and supplier b they came from two different suppliers but this particular stage of the operation had almost zero impact on performance and and in invariably it was proven that it didn't have an impact on performance about from where it was manufactured so they did this incorrectly and you know, finally, I got I got the hold removed, but we were late for shipping customer samples, and um, it was a it was an uncomfortable situation and entirely unnecessary. So um, I say in situations where this occurs, when the team struggles to recognize the difference between a minor defect and a significant one, factory test limits are over rejecting, over engineering of test cases. This is what I talked about. <laughs> being too good at what we do, um, you know, too many test cases that really don't uh, depict the customer environment. And the new product development team finds that supplier A performs different than supplier B. <clears throat> I put a quote down here, we can get too good at what we do. One of my best engineers looked at me once, he said, you know, we can get too good at what we do when we were over rejecting something, I forget what it was. Make sure that the defect is really a customer detectable issue before you pull the end on cord. And you know, part of that's how we engineer our test, how we engineer and how we train our employees. But um, it can it can get to be problematic. So what I'm what I think I'm understanding is that they found a small difference downstream that you said could be calibrated out or or worked around in the final product. So. Did it take much to convince them of that fact that, okay, guys, you found a difference, but at the end of the, at where we are, it doesn't matter. Was that tough to, to sell? Well, it was tough to sell because the Silicon team feels like they know everything. <laughs> and the Silicon quality person was junior. And yeah, it did take quite a bit of effort to get it removed and we're late with samples. And, you know, I used this example with them. I had a you know, quarterly meeting with them. I used this example with them, said, you know, this is not a defect. <laughs> a difference, a difference in one parametric, just because it's supplier A and supplier B, great for finding it, but don't stop the line, you know. Um, but you're right, Manny. Um, it, 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 you're exactly right on what it was. It was a midstream test and it wasn't a final test. That's interesting. And I guess you guys are really, you, you have, sensitive test equipment so you can really measure small differences you, um, have, to, you have to on rf products sure absolutely no i mean i'm just interested because they're comparing supplier performance but not actually comparing to a specification and yes you're exactly right part. it wasn't to a spec okay let's talk about flows simple and specific inside the factory and later i'll talk about outside the factory a little bit of supply chain uh in, inserted in here so what you see here is uh, a production line it's a it's a board assembly line and this is the what they typically look like and at the beginning you place a pcb on the line and it it puts solder paste on it and then it has a place where it uh, mounts all the components on it and then it goes through a reflow oven which solders the parts down and that's pretty much the basic process and in our original configuration in our factories, this was probably the first three or four generations of our product. Um, we would put test, our test stations, right at the end of the assembly line, and we would balance the capacity of how many testers we needed with what the beat rate was for the, the assembly line. Well, the flow was very direct. It was on the same floor, and the assembly, uh, the assembly side of the line fed right into test. Um, and uh, so our line was a direct flow and uh, one SKU runs through the entire process. So the, the key attributes to this, it's, it's set up just like lean, flow simple and specific. We have perfect traceability. We have no confusion on product routing and planning. Flow is visual and the capacity balancing is difficult. So, and I, and I talked about that because if you, if you change test times or test uh, reduce test times and then you have too many testers per assembly line because you don't change the beat rate or the uh, throughput of the assembly line. 
So let's talk about what we changed it to. And we did this for really uh, two reasons is one, okay, so we went to a direct flow to a, a flow that from one assembly line, we could go to many different test stations. And um, similarly, we'd have multiple assembly lines and they could all go to many different test stations that aren't in direct line with the assembly line. They could also be on a separate floor. Um, and this better balanced capacity on the test side because we could continue to reduce test times and we wouldn't have to reconfigure the line. There's another benefit to our particular products. Our products have a common hardware that's made in the front of the line and finalized with different programming at the back of the line. The one to many line is how we lay out our lines today because it allows us to actually determine the product SKU, the final product SKU at test, not at assembly. So there's a lot of good benefits that come from this. The common hardware or subassembly made in the assembly side of our process is made in large batches with no line changeovers. And supposing we're going to build 2 million units uh, in one week of a product family. And what we can do is we can create one large batch on the, on the assembly side, and we can make sub batches into the final part numbers at test. And we have probably 14 different programmable SKUs we can make from one hardware. And really the concept we call this is delayed differentiation. I'll talk a little bit more about that as it's a supply chain term um, later. But the final SKU is determined at test and we do lose direct one-to-one -one traceability um, the flow is not simple and specific, and the flow is not visual. But most uh, part, part tracking and lot tracking is traceable through our systems, through our, our databases inside our factories where we manufacture, how we manufacture our lots. And we can go from one large lot to many small ones, uh, and we can keep track of traceability. It's just not visual. The concept is called delayed differentiation. Oh, it's not sort of. It, it actually is not what you might expect from a from a lean perspective, where you're combining a bunch of stuff. And mm -hmm. It sounds like it makes sense, but but I'm curious where people are like, well, that's not the way it's supposed to be done, or that's that's not what the book says. I mean, how, how did you get people to buy into this? Because this was clearly a paradigm change. Uh, wow, the. Uh... It's interesting you ask that. The, when we got them to buy into this, we actually, we actually had to do something with one of our product generations called binning. And what binning is, is we have a particular performance parameter that isn't, all the parts don't meet. And some of the parts do meet. And so what we had to do to create our premium product is we had to bin out different SKUs from our, for our pre premium product. So what that means is you're but automatically, because you have to take one lot of assembly and you have to make multiple SKUs out of it, it forces you into this mode. And so I, um, we, we didn't have to do it this way. We could have still done it the old way, but this made it much more elegant for us to do binning and to bin out high performance, higher performance units from the lower performing ones uh, and create two different SKUs, actually many more different performance SKUs. But, um, and, you know, we did a Kaizen event and we basically came out and we agreed, we all agreed that we should do it this way. And that's when we did it. Um, and we also changed our planning process where it disconnected the assembly side from the back end, where I said we have fewer line changeovers on the front end. Uh, it, it's because we run very large lots. And um, even though we don't bin out performance anymore, we have high performing products. Um, it still it still is the most optimal way to run our factories. No, that makes perfect sense. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Russ. Please continue on. A little more on the flow, simple and specific in summary. Uh, the line design following lean to the letter of the law causes more equipment downtime than one to many configuration. That's uh, because of line changeovers. 
provides far less flexibility in determining SKU mix. By delaying the decision on the SKU to the back end tester, we save on rework, line changeovers, and no unused line capacity on either end when there's any hiccup. The delayed differentiation principle provided a more optimal factor utilization than the lean line. So I'll talk a little bit more about the delayed differentiation concept. And I've been to a couple of different, I've presented it at the last two WCQIs and I have in both of those presentations, I called delayed differentiation the sixth lean principle. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not technically allowed to change the lean principles, but you have to start somewhere. And uh, you see my last bullet is apply delayed differentiation to design and flexibility and delay decision making in supply chain. Um, delayed differentiation is taught in the in uh, an APEX course and APEX is a is a supply demand planning organization. And um, it's also taught in industrial engineering school. So let's talk a little about flexibility, which is often an orthogonal thought process to error proofing and simple flows. And, um, you know, our first lean project, a little bit of story, our first lean project was one of our value product lines. And we decided, you know, value product, we might as well see how cheaply we can manufacture it. And, um, and so we did, so we did a, a, a Kaizen, uh, we went to the factory, took a lot of data, collected uh, basically times and process steps, inspection steps and everything. And um, what we discovered was that we had error proofed ourselves to death. And every time we had a quality issue, uh, we did, we usually did three things. <laughs> We changed, uh, we put in an extra inspection step. Uh, we fixed the root cause of the problem on the product or the supplier. And then we also added another test in our final test. <laughs> okay, so we had er we every, in every new inspection we put on the line could be traced back to a quality issue that we had. But the problem is um, every silo wants to put in something every time there's a problem. And so everybody did everything and nobody had any discipline to say, okay, we're going to put one, one inspection in, or we're just going to fix the root cause and we're not going to add any more. Nobody had the discipline to do that. So what we did in our first Kaizen is we basically took out all the redundant error proofing. <laughs> All right, so I'll go, I'll go through and talk a little bit more about flexibility. And so in supply chain outside the factory, parallelism and flexibility result in resiliency. And in, during the pandemic, uh, resiliency was something that many, many supply chains and industries lacked in, their, in, um, in how they designed their supply chain. And this is a quote from one of my favorite papers, one of the defining papers on delayed differentiation. Uh, delayed differentiation benefits in two ways. It increases flexibility by enabling entities to commit work in process at a later time. And it decreases cost of complexity by reducing the variety of components and processes within the system. So the perfect application of delayed differentiation to give you an idea is the paint industry. Years ago, paint with paint colors were all mixed at the factory and shipped and inventoried at each retail location. By changing the product design specifically for supply chain, the paint industry zeroed out scrap and aging inventory while infinitely increasing color possibilities. And what they do is they mix the paint right in front of you at the point of sale. Um, and the funny thing is, this is a, one of the greatest examples of delayed differentiation I can find where you completely changed a product line for supply chain purposes, for inventory management. And I could find, you know, I could find very few industries where they completely changed their, their process of, of their product uh, like this. And ideally, every, if every business could customize their product at the point of sale, 
ideally you never have any excess inventory but we can't do that in the electronics industry we have far too many regulatory hurdles and other things that you couldn't uh, you couldn't really do it at a, at a at you know a, a thousand different locations so i'll walk you through the semiconductor uh flow from and this and 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 this flow is they're all a factory stop in the supply chain okay so it must ship from one of these locations to the next location uh, that you see here and i'll just talk about it in in general terms so we start with a we start with a wafer that you see on the far left it comes from a fab um, it goes to a bump site which adds little solder balls on the pads on the wafer still in the wafer form it goes to sort which is a test of the wafer to determine it, to determine how good it is uh, we go to a warehouse we go to die prep die prep is simulating the wafer and thinning it before it's in final assembly uh, from final assembly it goes to test once again each individual unit uh, to the warehouse and then to the board factory and the final PCB assembly factory and then then uh, final module test and then to the warehouse. So you see there's a number of stops on the supply chain. And this whole process is about, I don't know, 12 to 16 weeks. And <laughs> so let me explain where the green arrows are. The green arrows are how we differentiate the product for the flow that it's in. And you see if uh, our wafer starts uh, at the top route, it has one continuous flow and it cannot come out of that flow and switch over to the other route. So if there's any disruption on any of these routes, you can't, the product just stops. It can't move to the secondary flow. So parallelism only gets you so far in the silicon assembly process. And let me talk about why that is and why we want to change that. Routes are set by our enterprise planning systems and by design. The first step customizes our part for the path ahead. Six weeks of WIP is locked in with no escape. Uh, and in fact, during the pandemic, we had two instances when we had millions of units of product that we could not get through one of the, one of the process steps on either side. And we would have millions of units stuck um, in the time when PC demand was at its peak. Disruption or demand changes can render a path unusable with no option to reroute WIP. So let's talk about what we want to do about that. And I'm going to talk about fungibility. And you see that I've, I've taken out the first green arrow, which was product differentiation at bump. And um, and once we take out that differentiation, we have a common bump process, then we can switch parts and switch routes. Um, and, I, and if you look at my numbering scheme, it talks about what we did in each, each one of these changes. The first one is to lean, eliminate process steps, which is sort um, by changing the method of traceability. So sort is a test of the whole wafer, and we actually write what's it called a uh, a a universe a a, a uh, sorry a custom serial number into each part. We have a register we can write at sort to customize and track each each unit. But we wanted to get rid of sort because it's a, another week in the supply chain. The second thing we did was delay differentiation, make cross routes possible by designing an interchangeable bump process. The third thing in delayed differentiation is shift inventory to a new point of differentiation. Okay, so when I talk about eliminating sort, I've got a little um, red box around traceability and an arrow to the new method of traceability. Um, and you see I've got a barcode now on my, on my part. Now, when we took out the traceability by writing a unique ID into each, each uh, die on the wafer, we, we relocated that down to the assembly process where we now can pick, when we pick a location from the wafer, we can still give it a, a, a unique code and we do it in a barcode. And in fact, it's more visible 
um, or visual than the previous code, which was programmed into the die, which you really couldn't see unless you tested it. So all in all, to get rid of our first gate that's, that um, differentiated our product six weeks early, um, we came up with a new method to, to, to trace the parts. Going down the path further to eliminate some more of the bottlenecks, um, we came up with a common part number for all SKUs. So silicon is a, is a subcomponent of our final product. The silicon, the way it looks, is on the left, and the final component is on the right. It's a board-level assembly product with a shield over it to minimize uh, excess of radiation. And um, so we came up with a common part mark for our silicon, which could have four or five SKUs, but we just put the same number on it. It was called a family part mark because uh, we could sell it into different markets. We could sell silicon or we could use it in different product, different SKUs in our board level product. So by creating a, a family part mark, we could use the silicon anywhere and reprogram it when we needed to. Okay. Um, then I put number five step is a, a lean question mark. Is this a lean step or not? I don't know. <laughs> Cross routing to test provides an escape route for disruption. So what we did was we, we could not, we could not cross route finished parts. And there's really no reason that we couldn't do it other than our systems and our tools, uh, locked us out from doing it. And when we had one of our test sites go down, for about four weeks for COVID, um, COVID lockdown, we basically could not reroute those parts to the other test house. And uh, it, it was really very frustrating that our, our, our supply chain design did not take into consideration fungibility. We've changed that now. Um, and then number six is any component can be used in the final product of the same family because we put a common part mark on the, on on our silicon. So I'm curious, Russ, if you don't mind, about number five. You, yeah. You're even questioning, what, was it lean? I mean, it seems to me it is because you're creating, so we've commonized it. Yes. Yeah. I, I said lean question mark because... Lean would technically say flows are simple and specific, but now I can cross route, which makes the flow a little less, uh, a little less simple and specific. Uh, but it gives you parallelism. Um, that's why I, I, I put lean question mark. It, did I do a lean step here? Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sort of uh, curious because I can almost hear other people in meetings saying, but Russ, that's not what we do. That's not, that's not whatever. That's not. <laughs> That's not something we ever did before. So well, it, it, literally, they've never done it before. Okay, and it was it was an uphill battle to get it changed and uh, getting air air time with people. Uh, everybody's busy, you know. Everybody thinks you're not an expert because they're the experts. Uh, it's a lot of that, honestly. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Great. This is this is great. I'm loving this. Thank you. All right, let's keep going down the fungibility path to our final board assembly and board test. So I list number seven as final mechanical differentiation. So every silicon has two different final hardware SKUs. Uh, so that means we have two different PCBs that we mount the silicon on. Um, so we do mechanical differentiation there. And, and that's, only, that's only about two weeks away from the customer's warehouse. And uh, that's the place where we want to do the differentiation. We don't want to differentiate back anywhere else earlier in the supply chain if we can help it. Um, and then eight, I call it a delayed differentiation step where the final SKU decision is by programming. And we have about 14 SKUs per, per uh, single mechanical SKU. And not only can we program those at test, we can reprogram those if the inventory gets stale and change them to a different SKU. Uh, the, and the ninth thing is by adding fungibility, the final product decision is one week from the customer instead of seven weeks. Let's just summarize the benefits of delayed differentiation. 
create products that can easily be converted into other products with minimal effort. Programmable products allow us to reprogram inventory that isn't selling. Avoid requests from customers for customization. And we do have customers that feel like they're pretty special. <laughs> um, but what they, what they really don't realize when they want to customize something is that it really adds more complexity, inventory buckets, and less fungibility for them to return product, uh, for us to re reconfigure product, et cetera. Use common subassemblies when possible. And then lastly, use family product labels so that products can be repurposed. Um, and, and when we did this with our silicon, I talked about a common part mark for four or five different SKUs. Uh, that broke the rules at Intel. Every silicon in a, it had a different, that was a different SKU, had to have a different part mark. But the outer label on the packaging and the outer barcode actually put the final, the final SKU number uh, instead of the part mark on the part itself. So we'd have parts in different different outer boxes that would have different SKUs on them, and they'd have the same part mark inside. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And the only difference would be programming, to be quite frank. No, no hard where differences, but programming differences. All right, let's talk a little bit about inventory, which is considered a waste in lean vernacular. And um, I guess I'll start with a story. Uh, we we out for for printed circuit board assembly. We outsource that to a number of different factories. Uh, we make almost none of our branded Intel products in Intel. Um, and I was in meeting with one of our suppliers, who was one of our printed circuit board assembly houses. And the CEO was a strong advocate for lean. He was all in on lean. And and their particular company would literally keep no inventory. So there was zero flexibility if demand changed. And some of our parts had 12 week lead times, which meant that you can't change the demand for 12 weeks. Um, or you're always chasing components, always asking suppliers to expedite. And I finally, you know, I asked them, I said, you know, guys, you're missing shipments and I'm missing shipments because of your inventory practices because we constantly have stock outs. And uh, they operated with low inventory levels on every part, every product, no matter what the demand or life cycle or what the lead time was. All right, and uh, over the years, um, I, I, you know, we had a lot of disruptions during the pandemic. I call, um, I call unplanned upsides and supplier capacity constraints as the most common disruption. <laughs> When you have upsides and you can't meet the demand, um, you didn't plan for it, then you've got a problem. And we don't really want any stock outs because oftentimes, you know, if we miss a, if we miss something, uh, our competitors there to put a product right in, in place of ours. So I look at inventory not as a waste. I look at inventory in our industry as to manage uncertainty and demand or business continuity. Um, it's there for disruption. It's there for, as I call the most common disruption is unplanned upsides. And we look at inventory as potential energy in our supply chain. Now we try to manage that effectively still uh, by uh, and looking at the product life cycle. So when we're ramping a product, we're not quite sure how popular it will be. We keep lots of inventory. And when the product has matured and we're starting to ramp down, then we pare back the inventory so that we don't have excess at the end of the day. Um, the process works pretty well, but it means you, you monitor and you change your inventory models over the life cycle of the product. Um, and it can still leave with no waste at the end of the day. And our definition of waste is if we have excess after our product quits selling. So we minimize that by different methodologies. So um, I'm going to call your uh, attention to the sailboat at the bottom and the rocks that it's sailing over. Uh, this, was, this is from one of our training slides in the Intel Lean training curriculum. 
Um, and it talks about the reason inventory is a waste is because it hides other wastes. It hides other inefficiencies. And, um, you know, and I'll go through a couple of these, but let's say equipment variability, um, persons waiting or excess motion, process variability. Um, basically what it's doing is saying you've got problems elsewhere and you've got bottlenecks that are causing you to have problems. So you store up inventory to hide that defect uh, in your process. But what I find is you, you should have other metrics of measuring those inefficiencies other than uh, taking the inventory out of the system. Um, and because you should have other ways of balancing these capacity issues or yield issues or inefficiencies at each process step, um, should it dictate your inventory levels or your inventory practices? So in our world, um, we think that inventory as a waste and using it to find other inefficiencies in your process is really misinterpreting inventory as only a waste. And it limits our ability to design a resilient supply chain. You know, it is interesting that inventory typically is, it's obviously the, the, a waste, um, at least in some views. But one of the things I tell folks is that in the short term, at least, inventory could be the easiest way to buffer your supply chain. Um, especially the longer and more variable your supply chain, then the more buffer that you need. So. Any any thought on that? Like like, gee, if we were to go domestic, it would be so much easier, but we can't. So we we do what we do. Or uh, on those lines, you, you, I mean, you're do right. you see that? I think that um, I think in our case, we certainly carry different inventory levels based on lead time. Hmm. So the longer the supply chain is to get a component, the more. Um, inventory you need to carry to to be able to meet demand. Okay, that's a true statement. The second one is is how do you manage uncertainty and how confident are you of your demand signal? And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the the, the different scenarios. So an automobile factory makes a certain number of automobiles per hour, and that's a fixed rate. It doesn't really go up or down. That demand is pretty constant, okay? And, you know, automotive went to a lot of just-in-time just because they have a standard beat rate, okay? Now, for an entire factory, our factories are far more flexible than that. We can add or delete process lines and test fairly easily within weeks. And our demand is far less certain. Uh, we're not sure how popular a product will be, and the PC industry is runs about 400 million units a year. Um, so uh, we can we can shift our volume millions of units pretty rapidly, one way or the other, depending on depending on product transitions, and um, and not being able to plan it very well. And I call that uncertainty. How do we manage uncertainty in demand? And um, inventory is the way we do it. Uh, especially when we're ramping new product. Good question, Manny. All right, let's finalize uh, everything. In summary, in some cases lean can inject a certain amount of rigidity, limiting degrees of freedom on solution finding. I shared with you a number of those examples that technically violate our, some of our lean principles. Um, be careful with rigid application of lean. Expectation of strong agreement may cause significant delays on good ideas. Sometimes a manager needs to make a call. Hate to say it, but uh, sometimes you still need to go forward if you can't get agreement. Lean solutions must work hand in hand with other optimization schemes. And the biggest one I introduced here was delayed differentiation. Every product and situation varies. So different industries have different needs. And I think that uh, lean does not always account for all industry variation. Make room for creative solutions that may take some risk or violate the letter of the law on lean. And lastly, I say allow your teams the, the freedom to cr for creativity in their solutions. My quote at the bottom is from Bruce Springsteen's song uh, called Blood Brothers. 
it says, and what once seems so black and white turns out so many shades of gray. And uh, I think we need to find the shades of gray and lean. Uh, we do in my organization. And I'm just going to recommend that you go ahead and try coloring outside the lines in your next Kaizen event. Well, that's it, Manny. That's it. Wow. Okay. That's that's plenty. That's some some interesting stuff there, Russ. I got to tell you. Um, and what I love is I think you're making it sound so so sort of easy. It's like yeah, we had a problem, and then we got together and we rationally thought it out. And I get the feeling that in the background, anything but that was happening sometimes. <laughs> I tell you, man, it's hard to convince some people to change, Manny. Tell you. <laughs> Especially in Intel, everybody's an expert, right? So, yeah, I can imagine. Sure. Well, smart people, lots of advanced degrees, I'm sure, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's right. interesting. So how do you wrangle then all these, these I'm, I'm assuming, like highly intelligent people who who are very, very firm in, in their beliefs? So. Persistence. Persistence. There's no substitute for persistence, okay? Um, the second one is data <laughs> yeah. that shows <clears throat> data that shows how the current system is impacting our business or impacting our efficiencies. So if you can if you can show people with data, um, and that's not always good enough. Like I say, you have to add persistence because you have to you have to keep it in front of people and get them yeah. to commit resources to go make some changes. Because if if you look at if, if you look at the changes in the silicon supply chain, it wasn't it wasn't easy, and I still haven't got it all done yet. Um, but we do the thing that we do have now is cross routing um, in the supply chain, and basically, uh, we had two big disruptions during the pandemic because we couldn't cross route, and now we can. Um, I still don't have engineering. I, it requires engineering to commit to changing the bump process. Um, that's a bigger lift. Um, haven't mm. got that done yet. Uh, so we have a common bump, but uh, it's out there and uh, under consideration. And um, and again, persistence. <laughs> persistence, you know, so so it's interesting because what I'm hearing you say is, yeah, you got to have the right idea, but you've got to have a couple more things than that. One, you've got to have a good a good argument. Okay, you want to do something? Why? How does it benefit everyone? Uh, and and I think you've just got to be able to to work through some of these opinions. I mean, I, I I've sat in plenty of meetings and heard people pounding the desk and saying, "No, you can't do that. That's not the way we do things." And it's just, I yeah. guess that's just human nature, right? Yeah. You know, well, you've got to convince me. Well, and we have a lot of we have rules here for everything at Intel. Okay, we love rules, and the rule of uh, every every different silicon skew has to have a different part mark was a what a forty year old rule, and they never violated it. And everybody says, "What? You can't do that. Your customer's not going to like that." I said, "Well, the customer doesn't necessarily see it, but um, but what happens is." Um, and and basically, we we've never had a customer have a, a single problem with us using a common part mark. Okay, and while that seems strange, um, you know, people just didn't test it, and you know, so you know, forge new forge new territory, and you might be surprised at what you can achieve. You know what you're talking about testing the boundaries. You know what what may have applied years ago might not apply now and i think that's another lesson that you're giving us that you know just just because it was that way at one time doesn't mean it's still that way and sometimes you got to check the boundaries absolutely um uh, absolutely i have a, I have another colleague who's taken delayed differentiation to a, a new what i would call a new height in uh, product differentiation in our uh, our SSD business and solid state drive business, they uh, significantly reduced the number of SKUs by reducing the number of memory options and making it programmable on how much memory you're going to need at the end of the day. 
uh, shortened the supply chain by about six weeks and reduced their inventory excesses by millions of dollars. Um, it's it's delayed differentiation. Um, but then again, like they call it in the paint industry, when you change your whole product for for supply chain, there's a lot of people you have to convince. Um, and you know, making making changes to supply chain to product specifically for supply chain is not something that engineering really wants to hear or really wants to do. Um, but it's it's very doable. And you know, but but again, you have to convince people that that think you know supply chain just needs to to happen, and no matter what product you put out there, but you can certainly optimize based on product design. The contrarian's guide to lean is pretty well describes you, I'd say. Well, hey, yeah. I hope everybody can get something useful out of it. It's really been useful for us to kind of challenge the rules a bit, folks. Thank you for um, joining LED's webinar series. And we know you've got a lot of things that you could do in your day. We appreciate you spending an hour or so of it with us. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now.